Welcome to FieldLink. I'm your host, Bill Smith. On this episode, we're turning our focus to one of the most versatile crops in the world, corn. Yes, corn has been a staple in the food, fuel, and feed sector, but new innovations are pushing it into exciting new territories, from cutting edge bioplastics to sustainable textiles. On this episode, Dr. Alex Buck, the Director of Industrial Innovations for Iowa Corn will share some new uses for corn, including, believe it or not, fabric for big brands like Lululemon. He'll be joined by Ryan Stephenson, Helena Branch Manager in Guthrie Center, Iowa, and member of the Iowa Promotions Board. Ryan discusses how he became involved with Iowa Corn through the iLead program. Ryan will share how this leadership program has enhanced his relationship with local producers in his market. Finally, Jody Lawrence from Nashville catches up with us on the latest commodity markets as we begin to wrap up Harvest 2024. Stay tuned for this episode of FieldLink. And welcome back to this episode of FieldLink. Today, it's all about corn. And we're going to sit down with two guests joining us today from the state of Iowa, Ryan Stephenson. Ryan is a Helena branch manager at the Guthrie Center branch, and he's also a board member for Iowa Corn and Promotions Board. In addition, Dr. Alex Buck joins us, and he is the Director of Innovation for also for Iowa Corn. Gentlemen, welcome to this episode of FieldLink. Happy to be here, Bill. Yep. Thanks, Bill. Awesome. Well, we're excited today to learn about some of the innovation and some of the things that Iowa Corn is working on for producers as well as consumers across the nation and really around the world. But before we deep dive there, let's do a little bit deeper introduction. Ryan, tell us a little bit about you and how did you get involved with Helena as well as the Iowa Corn uh, Promotions Board? Um, well, I guess, like you said, I'm the uh, branch manager here in uh, Western Iowa, cover the two locations of Guthrie Center and Adair. And so we're just right here north of I-80, just west of Des Moines, about an hour. I was uh, lucky to be hired on to Helena in 2009 through our internship program. So worked uh, in, in the northern half of Illinois for three months. And then after graduation from Iowa State, took a full-time sales, uh, retail sales agronomy role here in the Guthrie Center location. And then about a year ago, uh, 13, 14 months ago, transitioned into the branch manager spot. Um, so now I'm managing uh, some people as well as the territory and uh, been, been a good transition. The, the way I got involved in Iowa corn actually uh, stretches stretches back to Helena as well. Um, we were doing a trip or a, uh, a grower incentive, I guess, to the Commodity Classic. Um, we kind of ran into some stuff from U.S. Grains Council. Um, in turn, joined Iowa corn to get a little bit more involved there. And that led me into some leadership opportunities through iLead, um, which is Iowa Corn's leadership and development program. And and that led to me getting on the board. So uh, running for election and, and becoming a member on the promotion board representing District 4. So kind of the Northwest or West Central Northwest area of Iowa crop reporting District 4. So represent those counties uh, in, in the boardroom. Wow. So what are some of your day-to-day activities with promoting Iowa corn across the state and really around the country? Yeah, so do a little bit of everything. Uh, Today, I serve as the chairman of the uh, Exports and Grain Trade Committee. Um, Also serve on the NCGA uh, Committee for Production and Technology. Um, So do a little bit of uh, EPA type things through the NCGA. But with the Iowa Corn Promotion Board, we mostly focus on trade missions, inbound trade missions, outbound trade missions, just getting buyers and sellers together, whether that's for corn, whole corn, DDGs, uh, ethanol, all the above. We also work with a couple of organizations, um, U.S. Grains Council, who we, you know, will pair with them when we're, we're going abroad as well as when they bring people here and then the U.S. Meats Exports Federation, USMEF, 
we do a lot of things with them. So in the last uh, year, I uh, did a quick little recap. It looked like we were on 12 outbound missions that Iowa Corn was represented, um, and we participated in seven inbound missions. And then we've got five just between now and the end of the year uh, where we're going to be participating abroad in, in some cases. So a lot of good things going on, again, trying to get – more buyers in front and uh the the thing that's resounding every time that we are somewhere is these people want to meet iowa farmers Mm -hmm. they want to know where we're producing corn they want to know about the quality of the corn that we are producing and they you know they want to see a face uh behind the behind the bushel per se so ryan tell us a little bit about what what types of i guess countries as well as businesses Have you been working with on some of these missions? I haven't been lucky enough to be abroad here in a couple of years, Um, but the last one I went on was in 2020. So we we took a trip to or a mission to Colombia, Peru, and Panama, and in those we you know we had a a packed agenda for 10 days where we toured some some farm facilities that were different than ours. So uh, you know chicken facilities that are using Iowa corn and DDGs. We toured a location that uh, basically makes sucrose. Um, so, you know, breaking down the, the corn kernel, and Alex is certainly more uh, versed in in the chemistry behind that. But I know that that was a that's a big deal too. So you get down into these other countries that we are shipping to. Um, again, just just building the relationships on the ground. So when they're bringing in imports they have a face to talk to or they have somebody that they think of, you know, a family farm operation that sold them the grain. Also helps with, uh, you know, if they ever have any issues, you know, U.S. Grains Council is right there on the ground in these countries to be able to talk through those if they have a quality problem or something of that sort. And again, there's just a, a lot of a lot of different places that we touch. And, uh, you know, we're growing in a lot of cases, as well as as having the boots on the ground to talk about policy abroad, whether it's tariffs or it's countervailing duties to make sure that we're in a we're in a good position as opposed to, uh, you know, say our our competition in South America, Brazil, Argentina, uh, make sure we're on level playing fields. Well, Ryan, it certainly sounds like there's a lot of uh, leadership opportunities for for you as a Helena representative, but also through Iowa Corn, as it relates to talking and and bringing new innovation to growers and and really telling that story. Yeah, absolutely. And that was, I mean, one of the greatest things I participated in was iLead. So that leadership development program, you know, it put us in a room with 20 give or take different individuals. Uh, Dr. Buck was one that we got to spend some time with in there as well. Um, so we, you know, we got to sit in a room and it it was fun to sit in a room and see all the accomplishment of other people in ag, right? So sure. the networking that happened with that group was, was great. You know, people from John Deere, people from Farm Credit, people from other cooperative systems, people that work in the, you know, worked in the governor's office. All you know, and then as well as having our Iowa corn staff there, so it, it was uh, it was a really great opportunity to broaden my horizons and uh, get to know some different facets of the business that we don't touch every day in ag retail, as well as on the farm. You know, just to getting to know other people and other farmers on how you know, hey, how are how are you doing things, and how are you marketing your grain, and and how are you being successful off the farm and on the farm and, and growing your operations. So. Well, that sounds like a great experience. And, you know, talking about leadership and talking about innovation, I want to pull in Dr. Uh, Alex Buck. And and Ryan, you touched it up. Dr. Buck was a part of that iLead program. And Dr. Buck, tell us a little bit about you. How did you get involved with Iowa Corn? And eh, tell us where home is and and some of your background. Well, Bill, uh, I was one of those few people in Iowa that did not grow up in ag. I grew up in Cedar Rapids. I went to Iowa State, got my undergraduate in chemistry and my PhD in organic chemistry. And really, my first involvement with Iowa Corn was looking for a way to give back to the state of Iowa to use my knowledge as a chemist to help develop chemical processes that we can turn, you know, any feedstock at the time. But, you know, it turns out I landed where I, where I can turn corn into chemicals, into plastics, into fuels. 
And, you know, I just manage these projects. We have a team of researchers at Iowa Corn uh, for contractors. No labs on site here at the Iowa Corn Promotion Board. But it's really technology where the farmers uh, lead us. They are parts of our board. They are our board. They are our committee. And they set direction and priorities for us as well. So these sorts of technologies and the work that I work on on behalf of the corn farmers using checkoff dollars is really for farmers and by farmers and managed by farmers. Wow. So uh, everything that I guess you're driven in terms of innovation is really being kind of led by growers in Iowa. That's right. The Iowa Corn Promotion Board is 100% funded by corn checkoff dollars, which is money that farmers uh, leave with us. And, you know, we have a really good track record over the many years that the Promotion Board has been around, uh, the decades even that we've been around in terms of innovating, uh, but not just innovation. It's also education and market development. It's things like talking to consumers about the benefits of practices that farmers use on their land, as well as, you know, corn traits and ethanol and all these missions that Ryan was talking about that people and growers have gone on or we've brought in have all been using checkoff dollars to help find a way to utilize more corn, whether it's innovation and developing new chemicals or fuels or it's exports or it's, you know, walking off the farm on the hoof. That's really how we utilize more corn. And that's our number one priority uh, for research, at least at Iowa Corn, is to grind more corn. But really, our long-term objective and our mission is to find opportunities for long-term Iowa Corn grower profitability. Well, that sounds fairly exciting. And and when we talk about innovation, Iowa Corn's really been in the front front and center of this for a long time. Alex, can you share with us some of the innovations that Iowa Corn's been involved with for for really? as you mentioned, decades, if not longer. Yeah, the uh, biggest success, I could say, you could go back to the 1970s with the Iran oil embargo. The Iowa Corn Promotion Board and the checkoff were the first ones to blend ethanol into the fuel supply. We had about five ethanol uh, plants, and we decided to take a look. Maybe this will sell, maybe it won't, but it was a way to extend the fuel when we couldn't get fuel during that time. And you can look back to the early 1990s when we worked on polylactic acid or PLA. Many people that I talk to refer to this as corn plastic, but really any plastic that comes from corn can be called that. So I'll just stick with PLA. And what that is, is it's a industrial compostable plastic made from corn today. And it's used in cutlery, silverware, plates, cups, and in fact, sutures or stitches that you get on your body, especially internally, you need them, are made from PLA because it's uh, degradable inside the body. Wow. So some of those stitches, <laughs> sutures, as you mentioned, are made out of Iowa corn or corn from around the U.S. for that matter. That's right. You know, there's a big plant in Blair, Nebraska that makes PLA and it gets sh- that that plastic gets shipped out to any number of uh, uses. But yeah, we, I'm sure we have several farmers on the uh, on that side of Iowa that are uh, delivering into Blair, Nebraska for that. Wow. Uh, interesting how that innovation over the years has been really very important for where we're at today. But why are these innovations continuing to be important as it relates to, I guess, new partnerships, patents, and even licenses? Well, you know, if you're if you look at the carryout or the amount of corn that we're going to have left over today, you know, the USDA is projecting, you know, multiple billion bushel carryout. So we just have so much corn sitting around. And we know that at the checkoff that when that corn's not being utilized, that it's not benefiting farmers. And so by developing new demand with innovation, whether it's for a plastic or any other products that we might be working on, we know that that's going to help benefit corn farmers to that demand. So some of the projects that we've worked on more recently uh, using uh, the checkoff dollars is a chemical called monoethylene glycol. It's used for polyester clothing. It's used for soda bottles and it's antifreeze. What's key there is that the patents developed for that technology were owned by the promotion board, so owned by the farmers uh, that govern our uh, our checkoff dollars. And we sold that technology to a company called Technip Energies about three years ago. 
And I get a lot of questions about why are we using patents? And the, the fact is, is that I don't know a single farmer who's going to farm land without a lease or without some ownership of that ground, some right to farm. And that's the same way with a chemical company or a chemical plant. No one is going to build the hundreds of millions of dollars to a billion dollars it takes to build a chemical plant unless you have some sort of protection to know that your investment is worthwhile. And that's what a patent does. A patent doesn't deter people from using it in the effect that it actually allows us to see a benefit and grind more corn because it's going to encourage companies to make that investment. Sure. And, and, and that just creates more energy, obviously, or excitement when you can secure with your innovation some of the things you and your team are working on to investors to well, consider taking these patents on to continue to fund other projects down the road. That's right. Uh, you know, to be clear, our number one objective is to grind more corn. But then if there is revenue generated from the sale or licensing of these patents, the, mm -hmm. the promotion board has their prerogative to reinvest it as they see fit. And they always reinvest that along with the checkoff dollars that we're uh, collecting. And so the more uh, revenue that we might be able to generate, the more we can invest and the more we can amplify the dollars that the previous checkoff contributors have com contributed to keep it going, to keep driving more demand for corn. Wow. Lots of new innovations and, and a great history, proven history from, from ethanol and obviously the plastic side of things and some of these new th new areas of, of uh, fabrics and so forth. But let's talk a little bit about kind of getting beyond some of the ethanol, so to speak, into some of the new fuels. Some of this, now we catch a lot of attention. Sustainable aviation fuels, for example, ha has caught a lot of headlines. How's Iowa corn, I guess, participating in that particular journey? Well, the biggest thing we're doing on sustainable aviation fuels or SAF is to help the industry understand the benefits of corn. Back to that education side, many industries tend to look negatively on corn. And so helping to share the narrative about what farmers are doing and the sustainability that they're implementing on their land, things like lowering the greenhouse gas emissions of corn, that's really what's going to drive the demand for sustainable aviation fuel. And while we're not putting any money directly into the research of sustainable aviation fuel, we know that there's lots of opportunity for us to influence others to look positively on corn so that they will develop corn for their own uses, for their own fuels. The federal government is putting a lot of money into research and development for mm -hmm. sustainable aviation fuels. And so our farmers have said, we don't need to uh, fund that right now the amount of investment for our checkoff isn't going to make much of a difference. And so let's find other ways to support that in infrastructure and support sustainable aviation fuels coming to fruition by talking about the positive of benefits of corn and ensuring that corn can be the feedstock for the future of sustainable aviation fuel. I think that's a really great point. You know, it, obviously this podcast, we're focusing a lot on the innovation and technology and some of the cool things y'all are bringing, but education really is a very important part of the Iowa Corns mission and, and really just, you know, a, a lot of trade associations. Education is so, so critical for, uh, you know, our members, but also the general public. That's right. Uh, I have seen in the 10 years I've been here at Iowa Corn, the view of corn from the consumers or from the industry that's supplying the brands that are supplying those products to consumers, the opinion of corn has really gone towards the positive. It used to be more negative from my perspective. And now I'm seeing a lot of people, a lot of companies are coming back to corn and saying, you know, this can really be a great feedstock. It's, in, it's industrially available on large scale. It is consistent and we have lots of it. Therefore, the concerns about some of these other smaller products aren't really going to be there because, you know, corn's been traded for over 100 years. It's a commodity, and so it's always going to be there, and farmers are going to continue to grow it. An example of some of the, the brands that I've seen is there's a chemical company in Iowa being built right now called Core, Q-O-R-E. They are in Eddyville, Iowa, and they're making a chemical called 1,4-butane dial. That's used for a lot of things, but it's also used to make spandex. And okay. 
coming to soon, we'll have a we'll have corn based spandex starting in about early 2025, from my perspective. And that core company has announced a collaboration with the Lycra spandex company. I can really see how this will help drive demand and influence people because you know when you're using textiles like spandex for athleisure wear, whether it's from Lululemon or other technologies that are using spandex, it's going to be a really great demand driver and a really great buzz for the positive uh, aspects of corn. Wow. So, you know, that that's the kind of innovation that's really cutting edge and really, really unique. So we're talking about a company that's partnering with companies like or, or groups like yourself at Iowa Corn to come up with the technology the trickle down to get into Lycra Sprandex, uh, companies like you mentioned, Lululemon and others, I'm sure, down the road for, for fabrics. That, that's, that's a significant game changer when you're talking to, Ryan, a, a grower in Guthrie Center, Iowa, who's supplying products to help people that are wearing Lululemon around the, around the country. Yeah. And it's, it's certainly kind of a, a growing joke amongst our board. You know, you don't see a lot of us walking in, in our, uh, Lululemon pants, but, uh, it, it is a really exciting emerging industry that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of corn when you, when you talk to these, uh, textile companies. But recently we had a promotion board farmer featured on the cover of a, a fashion magazine, talking about some of the, the, I guess, the work that Alex has been doing behind the scenes. Wow, that's exciting stuff. Yeah, and, and we're the promotion board didn't invest any money into the technology. That's a completely separate technology. But what's interesting is that we're here. Farmers are a very trusted group of people. And so when it comes to understanding their land and how they manage it, that's what brands want to know. They want to come to a farm. They want to see the corn being grown. They want to talk to the families that own it and understand what that, what what their vision is for their own farms and their own land, so they can help tell that story in a product. Guys, are you seeing you know those kind of organizations? You know, really to your point, Alex, wanting to become intimate with some of their supply chain suppliers. In this case, growers in Iowa who are supplying corn to Core, for example, in your in your example here wanting to better understand how that crop is grown, how it's uh, harvested, and understanding some of the sustainability, I guess, traits that go along with that. Yeah, that's exactly right. The companies are coming back and looking all the way up their value chain. You might have heard of the the scope emissions, scope one, two, and three, or carbon index scores. These are all discussions around the same thing, which is really understanding sustainability. And so when it comes to a spandex in this case, but any biosynthetic textile, is by the way, you know polyester makes up fifty seven percent of all textiles, and so you know mm. it, it's plastic is part of textiles and fabrics, and so when you're looking all the way up the value chain of how to get a bio based synthetic textile, I think all roads are going to lead to corn as a primary feedstock because of its ability to make carbohydrates and fiber and protein and oil. And the other thing that we are really, really good at here is the ability to have a surplus crop, right? right. Um, we are our own worst enemy um, in in that regards. You know, high prices cure here pro- high prices and low prices cure low prices. But as the the Iowa farmer or the, you know, the corn farmer in the United States, we do a great job of overproducing. So we've had that ability to go to these companies um, as well as our export partners and say, hey, you're going to have a good supply of corn every year because our technologies are getting better. Our crop production practices are getting better. We're doing it more sustainably with less inputs per acre. And we're, we're going to be able to provide you this high value crop and, and it'll be here every year for the foreseeable future. Um, and that's been a really, really big selling point with with these companies, as well as our the people that we're working on these trade missions with, is that, hey, we've got this stuff and we're going to be here next year. Yeah, that's a really important point, I think, for companies like Core to know that they've got a, a pretty strong, I'll call it local, national supply of corn uh, that can feed stock, uh, you know, their demand and not have to worry about importing, exporting and, you know, this trade tariff and that sort of thing all of the time. That That's a very, very valuable, I guess, source for a company like Core. Alex, 
one of the other areas that we talked about as we were preparing for this podcast was the whole area of acrylics and paints. And that's another area too, that, that sometimes gets overlooked by the average consumer, but corn is a very, very important part of those innovations as well. Yes. You're hitting on the, the other leg of the stool. I'm not sure how many legs this stool has. If we keep going, I'm sure we'll find, you know, more than three on this, on this stool. Sure. But- to check off not only funds research um, and does education like we talked about, but the, we also make equity investments in companies because we're aware that we're not the only one with good ideas. And so when a technology has been developed either out of a university or you know in somebody's garage, if it gets to a point where it's a, a company that is uh, looking to raise money, we will make equity investments in them. As an example, you mentioned acrylics. There's a company called Lockerl Technologies that we have made an investment in, and they turn lactic acid into acrylic acid. And most people don't know what acrylic acid is for, but the main uses of it are adhesives, acrylic paints, that's where the acrylic comes from, and also super absorbent diapers. And so mm-hmm having these sorts of investments and you know putting the money to work in different ways really helps diversify the possibilities of success one other investment i know we were talking about fuels earlier that the checkoff made is in a company called clear flame engines this company has developed a technology to retrofit existing diesel engines or even you know build new uh, diesel engines in the future diesel style i should call because it runs on E98, it's still compression ignition. I've been in groups of, of people who are, you know, see it and hear it for the first time and it sounds like a diesel. Well, you know, it's still compression ignition. It's just running on ethanol. The more opportunities we have to be successful, the more opportunities we can grind more corn and ensure the longevity and the long-term profitability of Iowa cor- Iowa's corn farmers. Wow. A uh, tremendous amount of innovation going on in, in the area of corn. And, you know, a lot of that innovation is certainly being driven by, you know, boards like the Iowa Corn Promotion Board. Alex, what's what's around the corner? I mean, these are some exciting things that are happening now. Kind of a magic wand question, I guess, if you will. What can we as producers and consumers expect from corn in the next five, ten 15, 20 years from now, in your opinion. Well, I'm glad you added those uh, 15 and 20 years because I think it's key to understand that uh, research takes a long time. And the Iowa Corn Promotion Board is never going to take a technology all the way to commercialization because we just don't have the funds to do that. The way we see ourselves is to de-risk technology get those patent or uh, patent applications and then fill the pipeline of the larger companies because we're not going to compete with those larger companies uh, in the chemical industry. We're going to try to uh, enable them to de-risk that technology. But what I see as the future right now is the Iowa Corn Promotion Board is working on uh, two main projects. One is called Vinyl Acetate Monomer. This technology is a foam used, you know, like those foams you might see at a pool, you know, the noodles or flutter boards. Also, Crocs are made out of this sort of product foam. And so there could be a pretty good demand driver for these sorts of foams, uh, and it's continuing to grow. Another technology is vinyl chloride monomer. Uh, most people haven't heard of that one, but I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of PVC or polyvinyl chloride. Well, this VCM technology is uh, used to make polyvinyl chloride. And so we could have corn-based uh, piping or uh, weatherproofing on jackets or the insulation on electrical wire. So while these are early technologies right now, that's really it really takes 10, 15, 20 years to get these technologies uh, identified, de-risked. And then, of course, you got to construct a plant. We all know how long it could take to construct something. Well, chemical sure. plants take uh, two years at least. Wow, that's exciting stuff that's, you know, down the road. And Ryan, that's got to just energize a lot of your customers, your corn growers that you work with in, in, in central and western Iowa. Yeah, absolutely agree. Again, I've, I'm in my second term on the board, so I'm just starting my 
I guess, fourth year. I mean, I remember when I first started, we were talking about clear flame engines and that technology about how, hey, this can really move the needle. And, you know, this this last, actually, I think in 24, a company called Vanderhaegs, you know, basically purchased their first clear flame engine truck to deliver to their 11 locations in seven states. Um, so it's it's that technology that's really come into fruition that you can actually point to and say, hey, this is what I'm doing on the days I'm not sitting in the office or I'm not in your fields. Um, I can say, hey, we, uh, we're, we're trying to get rid of this product that you guys are doing such a good job producing or we're producing on the farm. And uh, we can actually point to real results, uh, you know, from the last couple of years, as well as Alex talked about innovation going forward, um, what that can look like for corn grind. That's excellent stuff, guys. Uh, guys, I want to thank you for joining me here on this episode of FieldLink. Dr. Alex Buck, Director of Industrial Innovation for Iowa Corn and Ryan Stephenson, Branch Manager, Guthrie Center, Iowa, as well as board member for the Iowa Corn Promotion Board. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us and bringing us some deeper insight on how Iowa corn and innovation are coming together to really change the way we live. Thanks for having us, Bill. Thanks, Bill. And welcome back to FieldLink. And we're going to hop on the old bus here and head on over to Nashville to catch up with Jody Lawrence. And Jody, let's talk a little bit about these grain markets right now. We had our WASD report come out last Friday. Uh, It was kind of a story of not really a whole lot. Bring us up to speed on that report, Jody. Okay, well, Bill, it's good to be back. And yeah, the USDA put out their monthly report, and October is always kind of an interesting report that could have some wrinkles in it because you get to a point, especially this year with harvest moving along so quickly, that they have a lot more actual harvested data points in it. Uh, You know, whether the USDA is doing their, has their test plots all harvested or they're using anecdotal numbers from some of the, you know, some of their farmers that they have interviewed. But what it came up with and what it confirmed is that the U.S. corn crop is going to be a record and a record by a good bit this year with the yield at 183.8 and the corn yield at 183.8 bushels per acre and the bean yield at 53.1, you're going to have the two largest total crops that the U.S. has ever grown. And this goes back to, we've talked about it, been a constant theme really since June that as frustrating as it is to see these prices, you know, December corn in the 410 area, November beans uh, hovering right around $10, we're just kind of the product of our own success in the ag business. It's something that should be celebrated because back-to-back record yields don't happen uh, very frequently. And this is the largest jump from one record to another as a percentage in corn, that five bushels an acre over last year, a full 3%. And that just shows you how much potential when things, and now it's looking more and more like things don't even have to go perfectly because this certainly wasn't a Goldilocks season, but the numbers that we're seeing on yield and what we're hearing as both bean and corn harvest push past 50% probably in this af- this afternoon's crop update that everybody did a fantastic job from all the researchers uh, right down to boots on the ground on the farm and the stewardship of the ground. I think that is the story, Jody. Uh, you know, Mother Nature threw us curveballs left and right. There were some parts of the country that had amazing growing seasons and things turned off dry and vice versa. At the end of the day, uh, you know, you look at all of the yields that are really being reported that are still coming in, things look pretty darn good. And we're going to be raking records again. And to your point, boy, just a tip of the old Stetson to all the folks that are, you know, raising that crop, that are influencing that crop from, as you mentioned, research to, you know, the growers themselves, as well as the retailers that uh, that are helping, uh, you know, control weeds and and pests and so forth. And, you know, making good uh, fertility recommendations. Yeah, there there certainly is a huge team effort because you look at, and we'll just take the hell in the universe here, all of the front facing people, the sales staff and at all the locations 
at Helena have a team behind them. The you know all of the guys and gals at HPG and uh, out at the farm in Memphis, and you just go through a long list of your. Uh, suppliers bringing in new products for for y'all also that it's it, it's a total team effort and it's an impressive thing to see and we don't want to lose the force for the trees really that we have we have to be proud of what's been accomplished this year. Yeah. Speaking about proud, let's talk a little bit about some of these yield estimates. What are you picking up as you're talking to growers across the country, Jody? Well, everybody has been fairly consistent. It, there have not been a lot of report, widespread reports. Certainly, there are always, there's always a field or two for every farmer who saw some inconsistent weather that they're a little disappointed and there and there are some areas that they are consistently below last year Mm -hmm. but ultimately when it comes down especially with the usda is telling us that you have got record yields in the big i states Mm -hmm. and iowa and illinois in particular very difficult for fringe areas to have enough issue to really trim down that because you 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 know, one, once your big MVP players have uh, all star seasons, then uh, the, the other uh, other places can can take a hit or two and still not have a, a, a big negative impact on national yield. Jody, I was talking to some growers here recently uh, up in the Dakotas and then a few over in Iowa, too. Uh, they're combining soybeans. And boy, we've got some really, really dry soybeans in some cases that you know, 6%. Jody, when we, we get beans at that low level, obviously we when we harvest soybeans, you know, yeah, we get so many bushels, but we're actually running them across the scale and water's weight. Could that, in fact, in some of those drier areas, which there's quite a bit of it up in the north and the northern plains, impact some of these yield estimates that we're hearing about? Well, we would start to see that, yes, because I'm hearing exactly the same thing you are, because if you really go back to what's happened, gosh, you know, let's just call it since the 4th of July, Mm -hmm. that we have not seen a lot of rain and I certainly don't want uh, this this to... uh, to come out the wrong way, but had Hurricane Helene not come through a lot of areas of the Midwest, and I know here in Nashville and you know Western Kentucky, Western Tennessee, where they've got you know, great yields and and great farmers and a lot of acreage, we wouldn't we would have seen almost everybody has seen less than two inches of rain since the 1st of July, had it not been for that. So we know it's dry. We know there's some issues. And the yield issues that we would see would be later on when you start crushing beans to see oil content and some of the byproduct numbers that you get out of it. Whereas with corn, Really, the dry season has been a blessing for a lot of farmers I've spoken to because it cuts down on costs of them having to run it through a dryer, use some more electricity or some more natural sure. gas to get it down to you know where the elevator won't dock them at that you know seventeen eighteen percent level. But the bean thing is a is a concern because once they start to shatter in the pods when they are harvesting them, you end up lo- uh, leaving some bushels on the ground. So let's pivot just a little bit. You know, uh, certainly we've addressed uh, how the dry weather in the Midwest, you touched on it, the the, the impacted area from the hurricanes uh, throughout North Carolina and, of course, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee. Jody, what kind of repercussions are you seeing or picking up from the commodity side of things from those recent uh, devastations? Not as much. Cotton certainly got a little bit of a boost out of it. And I'll try to separate this from the raw material side from the tragedy of the human impact of it, because it is just incredibly devastating when you see and realize how long it's going to take to rebuild a lot of that. Biggest thing, infrastructure, kind of in the, uh, you know, Smoky Mountains, uh, Appalachia, in those directions. But the uh, you know, the offset of the rain was that the Mississippi River got refilled at least for a you know a period of time, so mm-hmm. that you could start to get more barges up and down the river, uh, beans and corn going down, and fertilizer coming back up. So there were 
pros and cons, but the areas that were hit were just not big enough or they were already harvested uh, on their corn and beans when you start talking about the Carolinas and Georgia to have a major impact in what we're seeing. But just like you said about the really low, you know, potential test weights on beans and falling on corn, that's something that we would start to see in the disappearance category Mm -hmm. when the USDA updates that and that's going to be more of a January calculation than it's something that would show up in the monthly reports before then. Jody, you know, certainly uh, the one factor sounds like we're going to have some amazing yields really at the end of the day across the United States and, and frankly, possibly around the world. Let's talk a little bit about demand. We've got to have a home for this crop. What are we picking up there? Well, what we're seeing is we're less than, I guess, three weeks away from the U.S. presidential election. And we have definitely seen a pattern change in China's buying trend. They are securing beans at a higher cost from Brazil in anticipation of higher tariffs if if Trump wins uh, the election. Now, whether they know something we don't know, I think they're just being safe because the reality is that the Biden-Harris administration over the last four years has not been any friendlier to China and kept a lot of tariffs in place. So it, it, neither one of the administrations all of a sudden is going to uh, win back Chinese business. And the biggest thing about China, not only the political tension, which is certainly a part of it, but their central bank announced that they were going to come up with several stimulus programs to really try to get the economy back going and growing since they really, their policies failed on how they handled COVID and what they did to get it restarted. And, but those stimulus programs, once everybody kind of got into the weeds of them to see what they were, just really weren't going to be the big help that everybody had hoped for. And certainly in the past, we've seen China come out with some you know huge packages because the last thing they want to do is uh, have a bad economy, political unrest, and you know, just just general bad news for their population. They've always been good about because the government's got plenty of money to be able to inject some fiscal stimulus. And right now, we're just not uh, getting China uh, anywhere near levels to chew through what you know our record crop and what could be if it continues to rain in Brazil, another record bean crop out of Brazil and Argentina. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that weather in Brazil. Uh, How do you think that will impact based on what we're learning about in certain parts of Brazil? Their weather's all over the board. How's that going to impact our supply globally? The September rally was driven, driven really by two things. And the first spark that got it going was the late arrival of South America's monsoon. And as northern, as pretty much all of Brazil and northern Argentina got drier and drier and it got later and later, that sparked some rallies, that sparked the funds to cover their shorts. And then we got that, you know, dollar plus bean rally and the 50 cent plus corn rally that hopefully everybody took advantage of that we encouraged them to sell. But when, you know, the the big picture of it, once that forecast changed, and it's over the last week, all of those areas are starting to see rain to catch their planting cycle back up to historic levels. And if it continues to rain, they're going to plant a record number of acres, hectares in South America. And even if they do have some yield loss, when you add more acres to it, you're able to offset that. And if they have a good growing season, which you, you never really know, you can't say for sure, you know, absolute certainty when you have this El Nino, La Nina transition cycle. If they have big yields, we're going to have an enormous amount of beans in the U.S. And beans is, uh, are, are where I am the most concerned moving forward, not because how it, it, and it used to be we would be concerned about how high can they go if something goes wrong. 
now with the extra stocks that we have stockpiled over the last year and a half, it becomes how low can they go if everything goes right? And mm. that it, that's what I'm really worried about in that respect. And I've uh, hopefully I've encouraged through the newsletter everybody to see the logic of being aggressive with the sales and the opportunities when they present themselves, because we know how quickly things can go. Uh, you know, from la- it, just from earlier this year, from or really from twenty three, from June to twenty three until uh, the end of January, and b- at the beginning of this year, once prices start falling and there's plenty of supply and demand is lagging, it becomes a real problem. And to your point, you throw on top of that some of the global unrest that we certainly still have (laughs) around the world uh, uh, in the Middle East and as well as uh, in Ukraine still have some things going on there. Of course, Uh, we can't we can't forget about some of those things. And of course, Israel, we got election. We got a lot of things happening globally, don't we? Yeah, the next couple podcasts is crazy to think we do this every two weeks. That in you know what can happen in another two weeks, but you know a month from now when we're having this, we'll know the outcome of the election. We'll be you know we'll start to get some idea of will the ceasefire take? Will Israel and Iran keep escalating further and further in the conflict? And you can see it what's going on almost on a day to day over you know basis. In the crude oil market, the crude oil market's had a very volatile $10 range. And when you're going from 65 to 75 just on news, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14 percent moves in one commodity just based on the latest uh, developments between Israel and Iran. So that's a it, it's a concern and it's something I encourage everybody, even though we're getting towards the second half of harvest, you see these dips work with your fuel supplier to keep filling up, filling up your tanks because with the Gulf hurricane season historically active, if we get one that takes the oil fields down and all the oil rigs for a couple of days and moved into the kind of that Galveston Houston area, we could see another, you know, quick eight to ten dollars added and get back and start uh, moving back towards eighty dollars a barrel on crude. Yeah, and that's that those are real factors that we need to pay attention to. You know, some of the uh, long term weather certainly looks like there's still potentially, you know, a couple more hurricane watchouts out there. And uh, to your point, you know. Galveston, uh, Houston, if it just slows things down for a few days, the impact there on infrastructure in terms of getting oil back up uh, uh, to different parts of the country through our uh, supply chain uh, can certainly have an impact. And we haven't even talked about, you know, some of the global unrest on top of that. So uh, certainly uh, pay attention to that uh, crude oil piece there. Well, Jody, I want to thank you for joining us here today on this episode of FieldLink as we wrap up and review the WASDA report and some of the activity taking a play around around the world as we wrap up Harvest uh, here in 24. All right, Bill, thanks for having us and everybody stay safe finishing up Harvest. Thanks for joining us on this episode of FieldLink. To learn more about the latest industrial corn innovation from Iowa Corn, check out their website at iowacorn.org.